Okay, then my name is Dr. Matt Barlow. I'm one of the senior lecturers in exercise physiology here in Carnegie. And this is Helen Gravesuck. Um, and earlier on, actually it was not last year, it was the year before now, wasn't it? Um, I was involved with the English Surfing Federation, or it's now become the, uh, the Surfing Federation of England, and the UK Professional Surfing Association. Um, and we were doing a number of studies, um, primarily looking at female surfers. And we had an opportunity to look at TMG uh, in terms of the TMG, TMG characteristics of professional female surfers. Um, we talked about this system being a, a portable system that you can use in many different environments. Um, so this is actually uh, the place where we took, did our testing um, in this little gazebo on the beach, uh, surrounded by sand, uh, which Karen was very concerned about. Uh, and we were running the system off a, a petrol generator and it coped it quite well. Um, this was, uh, the event took place in May, I think. Uh, yeah, it was the May bank holiday. Uh, and actually, Helen just told me she, she's actually lightened this image to make it look like the weather was slightly better than what it was whilst we were there. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the, soft, the, the equipment worked uh, very well uh, on the beach. So I'm going to provide some kind of uh, context, if you like, in terms of surfing. Uh, and then Helen is going to talk more about the, the actual TMG measurements themselves. When we look at surfing, there's various different components that can affect your performance in surfing. Um, so Mendes, Villeneuve and Bishop uh, wrote this paper in 2005, looking at all of the different components that might affect performance. So we have psychological skills in there, in terms of outwitting your competitors, making the right decisions in terms of waves, cognitive mental decisions, um, you know, judging the time left in the heat, do you want to exert some strategic pressure over somebody else, um, tactical decisions, biomechanical decisions and physiological decisions. One of the things that's unique, or not necessarily unique about surfing, but needs to be, um, we need to be aware of, is that the upper, upper body and lower body do slightly different things than what they do in other sports. Generally, we expect the lower body to do most of the aerobic work. So if you think about hockey, for example, the legs are providing the, the ambulation, the movement, you're running around and you're working aerobically with your legs. Now in surfing, all of the aerobic work is actually done with the upper body in terms of the paddling, and the strength work and the power work is done through the legs. So there's a slight different switch there in terms of what we expect of the muscles during this activity. Um, with a similar, it was a similar group of participants on a different study. Uh, we actually did some performance analysis and we looked at what the surfers actually did. And they spent about 60% of their time sitting in the sea waiting for a wave. 30% uh, of their time actually paddling around, hunting for waves or paddling back out to the lineup. And only about 6% of the time actually standing up on the surfboard and riding waves. And that's actually very similar to uh, what we see in male surfers, although male surfers do tend to spend slightly longer paddling and less time waiting than uh, female surfers. Um, in terms of the activity itself, I suppose we could describe it as a, a moderate to high intensity intermittent exercise. The average heart rate for, uh, for surfers is about 65% of their laboratory predicted maximum heart rate. So they're working relatively hard interspersed with session, um, portions of time where they're having a complete rest and also portions of time when they're working very hard in terms of sprinting. There'll also be some enforced breath hold, um, breath hold opportunities. So when a large wave comes and the surfer gets caught out, uh, they may get held down underwater for up to like 30 seconds normally. Um, and that would then affect their heart rate and other things that are happening. So as a result of the, uh, the nature of the exercise, how hard they're working, it's already been identified that um, VO2 peak, okay, so your aerobic power is important for surfing performance, and also your power output at the onset of blood lactate accumulation. They've been identified as, what, as, as predictors of ranking um, across different levels of surfing performance. In terms of what do female surfers look like, um, I was thinking of putting some photographs up, but I figured that's probably not appropriate. So what we've got here is the anthropometric characteristics of female surfers. Um, and what we can see is generally within uh, surfing populations, male and female, then uh, your mesomorphic score or your muscularity is going to predict your level of ability. So we see that uh, generally the more, more muscular surfers are the ones who are higher ranked. Okay, and conversely, if you have higher levels of body fat, 
then again, you're going to be, have a poor, poorer ranking in comparison to other surfers in general. Um, obviously, we do have some people who are less muscular and still perform well, and we still have some servers who are, um, you know, carrying a lot of adipose tissue, but still perform re reasonably well as well. So what we want to do um, as part of this study really was try and get some information about what type of muscles the surfers have, given the nature of the activity. Okay. And that takes yeah. us on to TMG. Um, so, um, based on the developing literature and research that underpins the physiology of surf performance, there's even fewer research articles out there on the biomechanics and the neuromuscular um, contributors of performance for surfing well. Um, one particular paper by Bruce Nepal, 2013, actually looked at vertical leg stiffness in addition to proprioception of different level surf performers and male and female athletes. Okay? Um, the vertical leg stiffness actually was a um, differentiating variable between the good and the poorer surfers in both males and females, whereas the proprioception measures didn't differentiate the good from the poor surfing population. Okay. What these two variables do have in common is that they are based on a system of muscles. So we've got vertical leg stiffness is made up of many muscles and isn't looking at this data from an individual muscle by muscle basis. Likewise for proprioception, the measures that these authors used here were from a whole body methodology. So again, it's not particularly well detailed. There is very little neuromuscular data, even from an EMG perspective, and not very much out there on lateral symmetry either. So the primary aim of this preliminary study then was to gather some normative data on the neuromuscular properties and the muscle quality of these unique athletes um, to help inform training modalities and recovery strategies as well. So the methods for this project, um, as Matt said at the start, we did all data collection on the beach and we had 15 competitive male uh, female surfers uh, volunteer for our study. We tested a range of different muscle sites, and you can see those listed here, and these have come from the upper and lower body. The sites were justified based on previous research from similar sports and by conducting a kinesiological analysis on the activity, thinking about the different phases of the surf performance, think about which muscles might be the prime movers and mo most interested to look at further. The sensor was uh, placed perpendicular to the muscle axis, um, at the muscle belly. This was identified using Seninam guidelines um, and palpation at each of the sites. All of the anterior muscle sites were assessed by the participant lying on their back in knee flex using the support. All posterior muscle sites were assessed by the participant laying prone with knee and full extension. Upper body measurements were measured by the athlete sat in a seated position. We used the 2.5 centimetre self adhesive electrodes and these were positioned 5 centimetres away from the sensor. Um, we used a standard protocol where 1 millisecond electrical impulse was delivered to each site starting at 30 milliamps and this was increased by 10 until we had the maximal radial displacement from the muscle. Maximal uh, displacement from the muscle was identified by using the software um, on the screen and the stimulation resulting in the greatest radial displacement was the one that we used for our analysis. We ensured that there was a 10 second uh, rest period in between stimulations just to make sure we wouldn't get any effects from potential fatigue or um, post-activation potentiation. All analysis um, was conducted in SPSS. Um, here we got a group mean data and standard deviation and conducted pair two tests as well. So in terms of our results, again, this is just a preliminary study. Um, we looked at two key variables. We looked at the amplitude of the muscles, so the maximal displacement, or, and also the time delay. Um, we can see here we've got the range of muscles uh, that we've tested. The blue bars denote the right-hand side of the body, and the left, the, um, the yellow is the left, sorry. Okay. We know from uh, previous talks today that a lower value for this displacement predicts a stiffer muscle, okay, and a greater value there is a more pliable muscle, and for a lower value on the time delay denotes a quicker muscle, so faster responsing, responding, um, and gives some indication of muscle fibre composition underlying there. From all of the muscle sites that we tested, um, we didn't find any statistically significant differences in either of the variables between the right and the left-hand side of the body. And this might indicate that our group of female surfers um, did have good levels of um, lateral symmetry there. 
So um, we didn't have a control group to compare our data against, and we didn't have any reference data either to make meaningful interpretations from our data. Uh, so we've relied on previously peer-reviewed information um, to try and make some sense of some of the things that we found. In terms of the TMG literature out there, there's not very much on the female population, um, and there isn't very much looking at multiple muscle sites in one study. So there's lots of studies that are focused on the lower body, and there are a couple that are focused on the upper body, but there are far and few between where they've looked at the whole body um, as a whole. So uh, looking at the paper on the left-hand side of the screen there, uh, looked at top-level female kayaker performance uh, athletes. Okay. In this study, they also compared the left and the right-hand side of the body, looking at the upper body sites, for the deltoid, trapezius, and the system dorsi. This paper did not find any statistically significant differences at these sites either for displacement. Out of the three sites tested by this paper, um, only one uh, was in common with our study, and that was the deltoid. And looking at the time delay, um, they also didn't find any statistically significant differences there either. Okay? This might indicate that there's a similar fibre type distribution between these two sports. Um, and by using the paper from Rare Town 2012, this could potentially mean that both uh, cohorts of athletes have predominantly type 2 fibres at this site. Another reason why we've got similar results here to the kayaking pe paper might potentially be the similarities in the movement and the role of the shoulder joint for both of, the, both of these sports. Um, Matt identified at the start that 30% of the time spent in surfing is actually spent paddling, which has a similar cyclical motion to kayaking paddling as well. In terms of the lower body then, uh, looking at this paper based on beach volleyball players, um, this study actually only looked at muscles from the hamstring and quadriceps groups. And again, here, looking at the left and the right-hand side, in the female data, there were no statistically significant differences there for peak displacement um, and also time delay. One of the things that we've questioned since doing this analysis is whether or not it was appropriate to compare the left and the right-hand side of the body, as contralateral limb was selected as the independent variable. And this has been used in previous work elsewhere, some of which I've just presented, um, and usually hasn't found any statistically significant differences. What might have been more interesting or might have been more meaningful would have been to have done a comparison between the dominant and the non-dominant sides of the body. Um, this is due to reported strength is increased on the dominant side. Okay? Um, it could also be interesting from a surf perspective to maybe do a comparison on um, stance position, so whether the surfer is a regular stance or a goofy stance. Um, and that might have been a little bit more interesting there. All of the studies that have looked at um, differences between the dominant and non-dominant sides do tend to not also find statistically significant differences. Um, and what this study does do actually is kind of recommends that it's okay to pull this data together in terms of looking at the right and the left leg. And there's one paper that has actually done that in football, I believe. So the key take-home messages again from this preliminary study looking at elite female surfers, are that based on the time thresholds, the majority of the muscle sites were fast twitch fibers, so type 2. And overall, our athletes that we tested had good lateral symmetry because we didn't find any statistically significant differences between the right and the left-hand sides of the body. Overall, this information informs um, surf performance in terms of writing training programs and creating recovery strategies for these athletes and adds to the limited body literature that's already there. And a more general kind of obs observation or conclusion from the study is that the TMG system lives up to its value of portability. We were able to take this piece of kit out of the lab and take it to the competitive environment, which for us was a British beach in the UK in Argus Evo, and it held up well.